Hi, I'm Joy and Pei, and welcome back to another episode of What Do I Know Where We Don't Know What We Don't Know Yet. And today we are diving into a topic that I am a little uncomfortable with because it's got to do with our private parts and sexual health. We're happy to partner with MSD to push forward today's conversation. For over 130 years, MSD has developed important medicines and vaccines and aspires to be the premier research intensive biopharmaceutical company in the world. My guest today is obstetrician and gynecologist Dr. Dash from Mount Elizabeth Novena Hospital. And she has been practicing for 15 years and is a huge advocate of holistic health. She's here today to talk to me about how we can take care of our feminine health, as well as address the scary C word, specifically cervical cancer and how it's preventable if we take the right steps. Hi, Dr. Dosh. Hi, Joanne. Nice to be here. I got that down. Yay! Yay! <laughs> And I was so professional there. <laughs> yes, I know. And um, <laughs> your jokes. <laughs> okay. I was very professional. You got it. Yes. So, Dr. Dashi, you've done many, many interviews. And um, I have to say that my perception of you has changed since we met. Oh, no. <laughs> because you always look so serious on those interviews. Yeah. But today, like, I think. You know, focused eyes and everything. And very professional as well. And of course, you are. I have to give some background about why I feel uncomfortable okay. talking about my private parts. Because I think for you, because you are looking at it all the time. All so. the time. All the time. <laughs> it's what I do. Yeah. yeah. I always wonder, like, how, how does that feel? It takes a while uh -huh. to get used to it, but then after a while, it's just second skin. We're quite happy with talking like that all the time. Wow. Yeah. Like talking like what? You know, like um, with my kids especially, it's like um, I use very regular medical terms with them. I don't say your pee-pees or your poo-poos and all that. I use actual terms like, you need to wash your vagina, girl, and all that stuff. Right. Yeah. So um, the thing is that they got so used to it that when they went to school and the teachers were describing things, they used the medical terms and they got in trouble. They got in trouble because the teacher was like, your child used the V word and everything. Oh. And then we had to explain that it's just a medical term. It's just a particular private part and everything is not a big deal. Um, but it's good. It's important for young girls to understand that these, even though we use the word private part, mm. these are normal terms. These are part of your body. Mm. It's not something to be ashamed of or to hide. And it's good to talk about it with your parents or your teachers and things like that. Um, I think that's where it starts from for a lot of young girls. If you're confident in your body and you understand that what you have is not something that's shameful, something you have to hide all the time, um, you become more confident in your own sexual health and mm. own medical health in general as well. Which is why I think it's so important for us to have this conversation. Because yeah. for me, I come from a background where we don't talk about our private parts. And in fact, when you ask questions, uh, there's always this, oh, you'll know when you grow up. And, and you're like, um, how come I'll know when I grow up, right? And, but you never dare to ask. And there's a certain sort of reaction that you get from your parents when you ask and then that tells you, okay, I shouldn't talk about it at all. You know, I wanted to ask you as well, because I have young daughter, a young daughter, yeah. and I want to sort of empower myself and know what to do when the time is right. Yeah. Um, is there a right time for us to start this relationship with a gynecologist? Okay. Before we talk about just relationship with gynecologists, I think um, we need to have a relationship with the body itself, mm. because from the very uh, early age, I think from age two, three years old, I already taught my children about being um, in control of their own bodies, mm. to be aware of what is private, what can be touched by others, what cannot be touched by others. When they go to the toilet, who can help them, who can't. It starts there, mm. where they are not told to be shameful, where they're not told to be fearful, but at the same time to be in control of themselves. Because we always hear about all these news stories about kids who are you know, like molested and touched and they didn't know that this was a problem. Um, it starts off there. Give them confidence, give them a lot of free way to talk to you about these things. After talking to them more freely at about age of two to three, mm. as they grow older, they'll get curious. They'll start asking questions. And it's very important to realize that this day and age group, like your daughter and mine as well, um, they've got lots of social media. 
mm. all around them. They learn so much from, you know, like Facebook and Google and everything. And TikTok. And TikTok. <gasps> oh my that, God, the videos. Oh, that is oh, a... Yeah. So it's like, after a while, I find myself redundant because they know more than I do. But sometimes they know the wrong things as well. Mm. So the important thing is never to make them feel shameful or feel embarrassed of asking like, hey, I saw this on the video. Is this normal? Is mm. this correct? Are we supposed to be able to, you know, talk about these things and all that? And let them know that it's fine. You know, like um, if there's something wrong, tell them no we don't always expose our wee on in the public and things like that or you know if you're worried about certain things about intercourse and you know you're curious about these things talk to mama first because we're the first line of defense mm. and then um, once they find that they are able to talk to you without being judged mm. that's very important because nowadays a lot of the tweens like my 10 11 year olds um, they already know so much that I didn't even know till I was like 18. And mm. I'm a gynecologist. When they ask you questions, be very open. Mm. Don't let them feel ashamed. Like, oh my gosh, ma I asked mama about this and now she's a bit upset. Maybe I shouldn't talk about it anymore. Be open, be talking about them and all that. Later on, as they grow older, that's mm. when you realize that they may need a gynecologist to step in. Mm. Maybe they get a bit active earlier or they start getting curious or they're worried. Like I have young girls who are about 12, 13 years old with um, unusually shaped private parts. Mm. Let's just talk about that. Labia is a bit enlarged and things like that. Um, and then, you know, they're a bit ashamed of themselves. So they feel shy going swimming with their classmates. And the mothers bring them in. And that's my job to literally say, this looks normal. Mm. I'm not going to operate on you. You don't need anything. Or if I do think that it needs help, I'm like, good, you came to the right person. This is what we need to do. And then we go ahead and manage them accordingly. So um, that's something very important. It goes from young age all the way to older where they're comfortable enough to tell the mom, like, mom, I think something's off. Like all my classmates say they're looking like this, but I look a bit different. Something is off. That's when they come to the professionals and they feel better. Um, and I think we talked about it yesterday about how certain um, like Asian parents, they don't talk too much about them, right? So the p kids come in much later, like when they're pregnant. Mm. Where else I have a lot of um, like the expert moms, they bring their kids when they're 13, 14 years old with lots of curiosity, questions about contraception and infections and all the other things. Because they had that first contact and it's a very safe environment. Mom's there, the gynecologist there, I'm there. And we talk a bit more about what's important and what isn't. Later on, if they do get into trouble or if they do encounter something that's a bit off, they're happy to come back to me on their own or they drop me an email and things like that. So it's mm -hmm. important that it starts young with the mom or anyone in the family who's a female family member and then it grows from there. Mm. I, I mean, you just mentioned that at your, when your kids are two or three that you already start telling them like, you know, boundaries and what's okay, yeah. what's not okay. Isn't that a bit too young? No. No? No, no. Because that's when they start going to nursery. Right. And then, you know, it's like... Um, I find that as a gynecologist, I feel responsible for every every female mm. around me and everything. Mm. And, you know, you hear about people who were abused when they were young mm. or, you know, they compare themselves. Because even when they're two to three, my kids were coming back from nursery and going like, you know, the boys, they go to the different toilet and they pull down their pants, but we need to sit down and they don't understand why. And mm. so you have to explain those little things and that differences and how they don't have to be shy about it. Um, and then I think... It's important that if mom talks about these things, it's no longer a shy thing to do. Because mm. I remember um, when I was in a child, when I was a five, six years old, a lot of my cousins, they used to call their private past my shame, shame. Oh. <laughs> like, you know, girls that do oh, shame, yeah. shame. You remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now that you mentioned, yes. I think like when you like, if you didn't like, if you sit open Sorry, and then shame, 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 shame. shame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't do that to the boys. They don't do that to boys. The boys can sit this way and it's fine, right? right. But when the girls, you know, sit somewhere, oh, shame, shame, cover, cover. Mm, mm, so mm. it's like, I remember that and it was very normal. But the thing is that oh, this is something to be embarrassed about. You're not supposed to talk about it, not to mama, not to anything because it's a very shameful thing. So that needs to be taken care of very early. Yeah, because when you mentioned this, I now recall once having a conversation with one of my uh, preschoolers' teachers. Uh, yeah. And I think, I think there were some parents who were a little bit... Uh, upset or concerned because there was just a lot of like this poo poo pee pee talk in in class and then all the kids at that age you will be talking about preschool and they are like giggling and like you know so so when we encounter our kids 
behaving in this way, for example? Like, what, what should we do? Yeah, it's very common. It's like all the psychologists talk to you, talk to you about this. It's like um, when they're two to three years old, it's the most funniest thing in the world to talk about poopoo baby in private and all that stuff. So the first thing is, to, of course, to address it and talk to them what exactly that private part is called. You can, mm. if you want to and you don't feel comfortable, you can call it, you know, a different word. Mm. Or if not, you can just use the medical term and say what it is. Mm -hmm. And then you just say, this is what we use to pee. And that's it. And this is what we use to go to the toilet with. And we need to keep it clean. And we need to cover it up because we're not supposed to show it to everyone else except for grandma and mama or something like that. <laughs> mm. um, so it's fine to have that conversation. And they're joking about it, which means that, you know, it's something new and it's cur that's the curiosity coming in. And that's the nice opening for you guys to go in and start talking to the kids a little bit more. Mm. But they don't need to know about the birds and bees at that age at all. Yeah. But they do need to know that this is an area that you're supposed to cover but it's normal and we don't allow others to touch it except for you know certain select people and then later on we're going to talk a little bit more so but then the bees talks i would say honestly maybe like nine to ten they start getting a bit more with the social media and all that then you talk a bit more about it mm. depending on the child would you say that this um that once a girl starts having her period, that she should start, that's the best time to sort of inform them about, you know, sexual health and, and all that they need to know. Yeah, for sure. Mm. I think um, because we need to explain to them. Um, however, one of the things I always say is that before she even has the period, mm. because there's no shock to a child because nowadays they get precocious periods. Mm. So they used to be 13, 14, 15 when they used to get periods for the first time. Nowadays we have 10 and 11 year olds mm. because the children are much more taller, much mm. have much more nutrition. Mm. And because their BMI is at the right stage, we have a get we are getting children getting periods earlier and earlier and earlier. So I usually tell mums that if you feel that your child is developing a bit more faster, so one of the first things that young girls will get is breast development mm. or you know, armpit hair and things like that. That's already a sign that, you know, the secondary sexual characteristics are developing for the child then i'll say start having the talk already like mm. look you know you're starting to get hair in the little places that you're supposed to talk or you're, you're starting to get a bit more breasts and now we need to have a training bra um what's going to happen next is your period and this is what period's all about and why do we have periods and why do we not have periods um and that's the way in again so i always talk about the way in how mm. to get in there if we talk out of nowhere the kids are going to be very suspicious mm. like what did i do why are they talking about it you know did she see me do something weird mm. why am i I'm something like i'm normal about me um but if there is a way in it's usually looking at how the child is developing or what the child's interests are or they start talking about things like oh you know my best friend got her period or something like that you can start talking there and then already what can we say as a layman because obviously yeah. we are not medically trained like how do we yeah. explain like why do we get our periods why do yeah. i have breasts and yeah. or even when will i have breasts you know yes <laughs> oh that's that's like the number one question <laughs> I, i'm still asking my mom this but um, <laughs> she's like soon dash soon <laughs> um, so basically um we, when we're talking about sexual development um in the olden days it was all about so that you can have babies uh, that was all it was. It's like, you know, so that you can be reproductive and, you know, you can have babies and things like that. I think we can introduce the word hormones and how your hormones are different from the boys' hormones. And that's why, you know, boys develop differently and girls develop differently. Um, and then, you know, when you have breasts, um, you know, some are small, some are big. You have to talk about the diversity very importantly because a lot of girls, you know, when they look at social media, even the 13, 14 year olds, I have girls coming in going like, I'm very small, what's wrong with me? And I'm like, there's nothing wrong. It's just normal development. Um, so it's very important for the mother because she's the first person who can actually like encounter this child's questions and everything to let her know that these are all normal variants mm. and it's fine. Um, some develop later, some develop earlier, it doesn't matter. And if the child still doesn't believe the mom, that's when you bring it to the doctor and then I can give a little talk as well. Mm. Um, and then when they ask about like, why am I having a period? And we just say, good, that means that you're developing, you know, you're, um, you're blossoming as a woman mm. and you're becoming, you know, like someone who has a potential to have babies if you want and as an adult. Um, and if you don't want, that's fine as well. That's an important question to have as well because otherwise every child is like, because I want grandchildren and then they feel bad. Um, so it's important to tell them that you know when you have your period it might be painful it might not be um and then this is the kind of equipment that you need to not equipment oh my gosh no <laughs> like these are the products that you can use and um you know less this whole like 
bunch of people around you who've all had their period and well still alive and well and that makes them reassured that they're not a freak and that there's nothing abnormal going on with them um so the main thing is that you're developing that's why you have your period and that's a good sign that you've got good hormones you've got good nutrition and things are going right mm. I, I suppose with the talk about period and now we are capable at this point to have babies and all that comes the next part yes and that's the next question right right so the next part is going to be about you know the whole sexual curiosity and you know what you, the sex talk that we have with the children like how, how do we go about with that yeah so it depends on the child honestly mm. like some kids are very shy you don't have to have that talk you don't mm. have to force it on them you know when they're ready they will approach you or if you feel that the child is getting very curious on the internet you know, like always keep an eye on the child. I always believe until the age of 18, keep an eye on what they're watching on social media. Mm. I think we have every right as parents to keep an eye on them. Mm. Um, so if the child is getting a bit more curious or they are starting going, going out with friends or if they're starting to date and all that, um, that's the best time to kind of like have a earlier conversation about all these things. Um, and then when they're ready to open up, they will. So mm. we don't have to force them at all. Like, when do you think it's the right age to have a boyfriend? Mm. <laughs> if my children are watching this, oh, it's 25. No, um, honestly, it depends on the child again. I was told yeah. 21. Um, I think what matters is the child's maturity. That's so important. And the openness between the parent and child. Because if the child is not very mature and there is no open communication between the child and the parent, these are the child, children who could um, be abused. These are children could be taken advantage of because um, they're not mature enough to handle all these emotions. Um, and they don't know how to say no. They don't feel that they're in control. At the same time, they don't have an open communication with their parents. They get in trouble. Mm. The child is mature. She's confident in her being. And since the age of two or three, she's been taught by her parents that, you know, these are normal things to happen. Um, you know, these are part of your own body and you have your own independence, to autonomy, sorry, to say no when you don't want something to be done. You're fine. You mm -hmm. don't have to worry about the kid. She's probably just going to go out for a movie and come back and it'll be absolutely fine. Mm. Um, and then if she ever gets in trouble or if she feels a bit curious or she's a bit concerned, if there's an open line of communication, she'll come to you. Mm. She'll say, Mama, you know, I didn't want to do this and I was asked to, what do I do? Then you have your adult conversation with her. So those two things have to happen. The child has to be mature and confident in her own well-being and she has to have an open line of communication with the adults who are taking care of her you won't get in trouble. I guess for me, like when my mom or my parents telling me that I can only date when I'm 21, I can't, yeah. I'm not allowed to have a boyfriend. Yeah. Uh, the, I think the biggest concern that we have for our daughters yeah. is um, the fact that they might get pregnant. Yeah. Uh, that seems to be the biggest uh, reason why, you know, we, we, we are asking our daughters to, you know, not have a boyfriend until they're 25. Yeah. Um, is, is, that, is that the only thing that we should be cons worried about? No, it's not just pregnancy. Um, it's their own well-being in general. It's infections. It's um, other things. It's getting their heart broken. If they're not emotionally ready to handle a relationship or the breaking up of the relationship, it might affect their studies and you know eventually their whole you know, life story as well. So um, there's, it's multifactorial. And I feel that, um, you know, we need to let them know about these things as well. Like if you find that your child is dating and she's 16, 17 years old, um, you need to have the convo. Like, are you ready to handle if you guys break up? Okay, that's great. Do you know that if you start getting active, you know, it'd be good to know about it because there is not just pregnancy, there's infections, there's all the other issues that can happen Hang on, hang well. on. Did you just say you want to know if your oh, child is... Yeah, I'm hoping that they don't. <laughs> and I'm hoping that they wait till they're 21. Mm. But um, I want to know if they are. Mm. Because if they get in trouble, I want to be there to help them mm. um, if something needs to be done. The last thing you want is for the child to go and get the help of a fellow teenager or an adult who can't help them very well. And or worse, worse, Google. Like, I think it's better that you have the open line of communication. Let them know because everyone has different cultures, different expectations. We're Catholic, so we're like, no, until you're 35. No, <laughs> you know, it's literally like... You just push back 10 years again. Push back another 10 years because of that. So it's like every culture is different. Every, you know... 
household is different and yeah, everything. Yeah. So you can always let them know what you your expectations are. What your, maybe not expectations, that's a bit harsh. Mm. Your hopes are. Mm. I really hope that you wait. I really hope that when you're mature enough and your studies are not that important, like you've already gone to university and you're fine and you're mature enough that I feel that you're ready to handle a uh, relationship, that's the time they choose. Then they'll respect you because then they go like, okay, she means well. It's not a dictatorship. It's more of like, she's concerned of all these things and mm-hmm. I agree with her. I need to maybe finish my whatever before I start having um, a relationship and they will listen to you. Mm. And it's always about pregnancy, but it's never always pregnancy. There's so many other things that you worry about as well. Let's talk about these other things that we <laughs> should be worried about. Yeah. Okay. So basically, you know, I'm sure you've heard of STDs and everything. You know, we always say, okay, if you wear condoms, then, you know, you will not get anything. But that's not true because teenagers and young adults may not always be you know, careful. So one slip up and you might have an infection that lasts a lifetime. There are many infections that can be cured for sure. But there are many infections that stay with you for a long time, like chlamydia. Um, Whatever age you get it, a lot of times it doesn't leave your body completely. It can affect your reproductive organs and leave you infertile. And then because it blocks your tubes and goes off if it's not treated. So if you have a young girl who's 21... Um, had chlamydia, didn't know about it, left it in her system for many years um, without any treatment. It can block her tubes and she becomes infertile. So these are things that people don't really talk about or are aware of. Um, And HIV, of course, is permanent as well. I mean, of course, we've got lots of medication to treat and keep it under control. But the best way is not to get it in the first place. Mm -hmm. Um, There are other viruses like HPV, you know, which can cause cervical cancer. um, And that can't even be protected by condoms. It's like that is like it's by any kind of intimate contact. And the moment you get contact with it, then you have a chance of getting issues in the future. So these are things that you have to be aware of mm. um, so rather than following my advice or telling my girls go- boys are gross it's more of like just be careful be aware of what's out there it's not just pregnancy that you have to worry about mm. and as long as that's there um, then they're more aware of what they need to worry about so for the longest time I used to be really terrified of this cervical cancer but then uh, I, I, f- I feel like, you know, we need to learn more about it and to learn more. And, and, and a lot of people are telling me also like, oh, you know, even my nutritionist is telling me like, oh, no, it's not so scary. You know, nowadays yeah. you can prevent it. So let's yeah. talk a little bit about, because uh, you mentioned HPV uh, oh. causing c- cervical cancer. Uh, let's talk a little bit about HPV and actually what is it? Mm-hmm. And um, can we tell, like, are there any signs? Because we know like with sexually transmitted diseases, it comes off a little bit more obvious, right? Like you have um, warts and um, what are the symptoms that you, you, you can see, spot? Yeah. So in most SCDs, you know, patients talk about discharges, mm. itchiness, discomfort, lumps and bumps and all mm. that. Mm-hmm. So we immediately know something's off. Mm. Then we do the right test and we'll find out what's going on. Um, the thing about HPV is that um, there are, um, there's also a couple of them which cause genital warts as well. So mm. there are different kinds of diseases that HPV can cause. So the human papillomavirus, um, if it's a type 6 or 11, it causes those, you know, the genital warts that we talk about. Mm. It can also cause the simple ones, like, you know, the little planter warts that some people have on their fingers, on their toes. Mm. That's also HPV as well. So, oh, yeah. so not just yeah. in your uh, private area. Not just in your private area. Oh. So HPV, for example, you know, um, if you're sharing shoes with strangers all the time, like if you go scuba diving or to the gym and you're sharing those rubber shoes that are wet and moist, mm. there's a chance that you can pick up HPV just from that. Intimate skin contact is the one way that HPV is spread. So it's never just by intercourse, mm. just by touching someone who has a direct um, lesion. It can um, come to you. But the only problem is that that's the only time when you can see it. Otherwise, you don't see it. It's very asymptomatic. Mm. 80% of sexually active adults have HPV. But that's not necessarily the high-risk one. So you don't have to worry that, oh my gosh, I'm going to get cervical cancer and things like that. So there are over 100 types. So type 16 and type 18, um, they account for cervical cancer causing um, uh, viruses. Um, And then these are the ones that we want to protect our young girls against. Mm. And so that's why nowadays, you know, we're getting all these vaccinations for the young girls and everything to help them. How does uh, this vaccine work? Um, It's basically a protein that looks just like the outside part of the virus. If you're protected and you have antibodies to protect you against HPV, then you have a lower chance of having that long-term in your body as well. 
Uh, however, it's very important that vaccination is not just it. It's important to keep screening as well because mm -hmm. it's not like a 100% protective thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to see your very friendly gynecologist mm -hmm. and um, get your pap smears. Okay. So, um, have you done your pap smear, Joanne? Yes, I have. Before yeah. we go into pap smear, uh, I wanted to ask this also. Uh, at what age should we bring our girls in for this vaccination? Ah, uh, yes. So, usually um, now in um, Singapore, the schools are starting to vaccinate them at age 13 to 14 years old. Mm. And that's one of the things I like to talk about is that this is a time where you can have the next conversation. You know, this is another outlet where you can like talk to the kid like why am I vaccinating you against a virus what's what's it going to cause to you mm. and what's it going to protect you and again talk about body autonomy and protection and how you are in control of everything mm. um, so the age group will be from 9 to about 14 15 years of age mm. um, that's the best vital time before they become active and before the immunity becomes a bit more waning in nature um, I think that's the best age and what about yeah. those people who feel that you know I, I, I I'm not for vaccines, yeah. uh, I will just do screenings and, 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 and see how that goes. You know, I don't want to take a vaccine and put stuff in. What, what, what is your We take have to respect them. Oh, right. It's like, you know, like, after all, it's like, um, it's, it's my body, my choice kind of thing, right? <laughs> Get it from the Americans. <laughs> so they are allowed to choose that. Um, but what I always explain to patients is this. We finally have a vaccine, or actually three different types of vaccines, that can protect against a certain kind of cancer that attacks a lot of women. So it's useful. And the fact that over 80% of women can have HPV, mm. that's a large number. Mm. So because of that, I would advocate for, you know, pushing for the vaccination of everyone, you know, um, to protect themselves um, and then just keep going from there. So unlike the COVID vaccine, which uh, a lot of people are sort of thinking that, you know, it's so quick, you know, yeah. the HPV vaccine has uh, yeah. actually gone through lots years of studies. of studies. Lots of studies. But along with screening, which is very important still, you still need to screen. Which is pap smear. Pap smears. So you still need to do pap smears. And then you can also, every five years, you can do your HPV test as well. Along with that, I think because of the vaccine, the rate has gone down so much. Mm. And in countries where they've started um, vaccinating the young students in school, so it became part of the school policy mm. because you know in the long term these women they were produ reproductive they had kids and everything thankfully now in Singapore we've also started to vaccinate the young ones at the age of 13 and 14 mm. and hopefully that will also bring another exponential decrease in cervical cancer rates in Singapore as well I've also read some material saying that if we have HPV it's very likely that our sexual partners also have HPV so how can we have like involve the men in this conversation yes so they too should be protected because they too can develop things like anal cancer so it's very important that the boys also get protected as well mm. does it mean that once we get the vaccine that we will not get hpv nah yeah they always ask me that <laughs> um, okay. so the thing is no unfortunately so remember there are over 100 different types mm. so there are two major types type 16 and 18 which cause most of cervical cancer and then there are major ones that cause almost like 95 percent of cervical cancers as well right. as long as you're active and you're exposed it's still possible to get cervical cancer so it's important to keep screening all the way um, what's good is that now that we can um, swap you for HPV and look at the types if you don't have the high risk ones mm. you can do your pap smears every five years mm. if you do have the high risk ones then the gynecologist may say maybe let's do it every year mm. and screen you every year to keep an eye on stuff um, but you do not let go of it all the way until maybe the age of 65 and then after that you should be all right how, how long does it take for this um, HPV to develop into like a full-blown cancer yes Oh, yeah, so okay. nothing to worry about. Um, again, because you don't know that you got it. Mm. Because, you know, it's asymptomatic. Sometimes patients may not know that they have HPV. Mm. So that's the purpose of screening, is to check for early changes. And these changes are not cancer at all. These are just early changes in cells that tells the gynecologist that, hey, there's a HPV that's going rogue. It's starting to cause changes in the cervix. We need to get in there and treat it so that it doesn't develop. Mm. And by treatment, we're talking about zapping that area or taking out a small area of the tissue and everything so that the patient never develops cervical cancer. Mm. And one thing that we always tell patients is this. As long as you're screening regularly mm. and according to the schedule that your gynae puts you on, touch wood, 
have never seen a patient develop cancer mm. because there is a long time, around 10 years or even longer before you actually develop um, cervical cancer signs and symptoms and everything. Mm. So if we can catch you early, we can treat you and there is no way you'll end up with that. Uh, when you mean the treatments, uh, does it affect your you know, childbearing abilities or does it yeah. cause any changes, changes to you? Right. Yeah. Depending on where we find. So for example, um, we have these things called CIN1, 2 or 3. These are what precursors to cancer, but they're not cancers. It's just pre-changes that can be happening because of HPV. So if I see someone with CIN1, I'll just say, look, you know, amp up. This is where my holistic bit comes in. You know, like amp up your vitamin C's, your probiotics. You know, do yoga. Stop swimming. Uh, stop smoking. Not swimming. You can swim. You know, stop smoking. Um, but it's not always like don't get pregnant. It's more important. Um, and mm. then you know, those kind of things can help to improve your immunity. Mm. And then by doing that, maybe that will reduce the chances of HPV progressing further. If they develop CIN two or three, again, these are not cancers, just pre changes. Then we do this thing called a deep cone biopsy, which is where we go to the neck of the womb and we do this tiny little surgery to remove a very small area of the um, cervix. We take it out and then that's it. All the cells leaving behind are normal, healthy. Mm. And then she's back to square one. Then we just keep an eye on her mm. next. So can still have babies and, For sure. and give birth and it doesn't, yeah. you don't pass it on to your child as well. There are very rare times where the mother has an active um, genital wart. Mm. So if you have genital watch, which is due to HPV type 6 and 11, then you've got these little lumps and bumps, your obstetrician will know about it. She will see it and go like, look, we're not going to have a vaginal birth. Because if you do that, the HPV will directly go into the baby and it can develop in their oral pharynx area. So you know the vocal cord area and all that stuff, it can have HPV. And mm. then the baby can't swallow and then they have a lot of issues. So that's a very serious but very rare um, papillomatosis thing that we call. Mm. Um, but it doesn't happen often. If you don't have an active lesion, you can have a vaginal birth without any problem at all. Mm. So, you know, since you, you mentioned that 80% of us have got HPV uh, and very likely that we, we have it and we don't, yeah. is it something to be ashamed of? No. 80 percent must be shame shame you don't have to be ashamed for sure um because it's something that happens all the time um what's important is that you get the right screening the mm. right monitoring and as long as um you know you don't have any active lesions and all that you don't need treatment it's when you start having lesions that's when you know the gynecologist will get in and start doing surgeries and things like that mm. um, and it should be fine and you'll never ever pass it to your babies unless you have an active lesion due to genital herpes mm. sorry genital um, hpv Okay, so yeah. you mentioned just now that the baby might even get it in the yeah. throat. So, you know, people laugh, like, wait, I mean, not laugh, but there's just been like a lot of teasing or not teasing. I, I don't even know if that's the right way. I know what you're going for. We, we're talking about Michael Douglas here, you know. Uh, so, so what is the truth? I mean, is he going to sue me? Because, <laughs> you know, I mean, okay. so, we want to be yeah. informed here. We yeah. don't want to be misinformed. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. is, it, is it because he had oral sex or um, you know okay. he could have caught it so that's all hearsay uh, yeah joanne <laughs> okay so, but in general um we do know that if you get hpv um and it's in your esophageal area and it's one of those high risk ones there is a potential for it to develop into esophageal cancer mm. and it's due to the virus and that's how it you know like progresses form and all that um whether you know like one person's esophageal cancer due to HPV or not, we don't know. Because mm. esophageal cancer has so many other reasons as well. Like you can have a gastric issue or reflux mm. that causes a lot of acidity and that causes esophageal cancer as well. But it could also be due to HPV as well. Mm. So the reason why we always try to talk about, you know, like the non-cervical cancer stuff about HPV is that it affects both genders. Mm. Um, that's the main take home that I want to tell is that um, we don't know whether, you know, like who will develop it, who will not. But we do know that um, she is not the only one who's going to be affected by it. Mm. So if he is protected too, um, that would be an amazing thing. And if all mums could hear this story and know that, you know, I want to protect my son. And I also want to protect my son's future partners as well. Um, it'll be the right thing to do to help them all. Mm. Um, and that's what I'm hoping for. So how best can we have this conversation with our kids then? Like, 
just before we, let's say we want to take them for the vaccination, how, how do we yeah. talk to them about yeah. it? So again, it started from the age of two. <laughs> and then we're having this conversation. We're talking about all these things. And the funny go like, um, you know, nowadays in P5, that's when they had the first sexual education talk by yes. the government and everything. Right? Okay. So you can start with that. And then you say that this is to protect you against a very dangerous disease um, called cancer. Not many children know about it. They heard about it, but they don't know what it is because it usually affects older people in their 90s and all that. So you tell them that this is a cancer that can affect young women and young men as well. And we can protect you or give you a high chance of not developing it into cancer. And then during that time, we can also talk about how, you know, pregnancy is not the only thing you worry about in sexual health and that how other infections can also be spread by, you know, sexual intercourse and how, you know, um, not just the pill, you need condoms as well to protect you. And unfortunately, this particular virus, it's not protected by the hondo, like not completely, mm. because as long as any kind of skin contact, it can affect you and that's why before they become active we're going to give this to you there are questions about okay we do this they're going to be so active the next day mm. <laughs> like give this to a nine-year-old and by the 10 years old she's out there and <laughs> like you know flourishing but no no study has shown that to mm. happen at all mm. in fact the children feel more safe they feel like you know the adults around them are protecting them against something that's dangerous the trust is built in that way as well and they also feel more reassured like okay now i'm just this more safer in this world because of this injection and my mom's had it my dad's had it and now i'm having it so it becomes more reassuring mm. okay i think we've covered quite a bit is, is there anything that i didn't manage to sort of ask you, uh, you know, that you can share either from your sort of personal encounters with your patients or some of the questions that they may have asked you that I haven't thought of, that they I have. always asked about cost, like protection and everything. Um, I really think, you know, like if it was covered by the government, it would be amazing. So I think that's the main thing that I'm hoping for nowadays as well, so that my patients don't have to worry about cost because if it's a, such a small cost compared to the cost of treating cervical cancer or a baby that's affected by a mum who had genital warts, mm -hmm. it's so low compared to that. Um, and if we could cover across the board for whatever choice the patient makes, that'll be very vital. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I also wanted to sort of, because uh, I just remembered that, you know, uh, to talk a little bit about how uh, a pap smear procedure is like okay. for those who are maybe uncomfortable, yeah. you know, bearing your legs open to a gynecologist. <laughs> if it's done right, Stuart, <laughs> if it's done right, it's so painless, it's nothing. It's like a walk in the park. Which really? a dodgy kind of a dodgy kind of walk in the I, park. Well, but honestly, it's nothing. Um, because the main thing is that the gynecologist job is to put you at ease and make mm. you feel comfortable um, and then we use this um, device called the speculum which is this very tiny little thing the size of like two thumbs kind of thing um, to insert into the vagina we have a look at the cervix and then we just do a quick couple of brushes and that's it mm. it takes less than a minute but it's very very simple to do it's like an ART for the vajayjay <laughs> that's what it's like oh yes that's like, like we should advertise it this way <laughs> ART for the vajayjay and that's the way to go <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Dr. Darsh, for I making so. this so entertaining and, and so lighthearted. And I, and I believe that my listeners would definitely benefit from this, knowing that there's uh, the, the vaccine that they can take, knowing that there's screening that they can do, and how cervical cancer is really not that scary if you actually take the right steps. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Darsh. We've come to the end of the episode, but before we say goodbye, please give us a thumbs up and hit subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. The audio version of this podcast is available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Now that you've heard from Dr. Dash, does it make you feel more confident about the HPV vaccine? If not, why not? Share your thoughts with us in the comments below. We'll see you in the next episode. Bye!